Welcome to my program, Bashir's Corner. We take programs and make a discussion with people who have something very important to say to the society. And normally we discuss those issues which mainstream media doesn't want, doesn't care, or maybe they have their own agenda, but we don't. And when our viewers will meet our next guest, so we will understand why I said that. Denmark is one of the most literate and informed societies in the world. With 100% literacy, most Danes can also speak English, and I know that from 70s. Sometimes, English is almost as popular among the youth as their own mother tongue, Danish. And also, English is taught in school now as a compulsory language. And after Holland and Sweden, Denmark is the most English-speaking country in Europe. There are hundreds of magazines, newspapers in Danish language, and now some also in English. And that is why, because with the arrival of the migrants, there was a need to expand this knowledge and information to those people who, who didn't speak Danish language. So my guest today is a living proof that English has taken hold in Danish society. He is editor-in-chief of a very exciting monthly newspaper. Welcome to my program, Peter. Thank you, Bashi. You studied uh, photography, I understand. Yeah. Um, and also urban cultures mm. at Goldsmith College, very prestigious yeah. college in, in London. Uh, Photography, I can understand. Yeah. But what is urban culture? Right. So the um, this was my master's degree was photo uh, yeah uh, photography and urban cultures. The idea was to mix sociology about um, the urban environment mm. using visual methodologies. So it was half sort of uh, looking at how people live in cities and the history of cities. Um, and then how do we talk about cities um, using visual methodologies and, and, and in our case photography and uh, it was very exciting to, to go out and um, try to communicate in a way that wasn't strictly academic. It was a very exciting course, yeah. So a photograph is better than a million words. I don't know that's, about that's what people say. I, I don't know about that. I, I think that definitely uh, they, they complement each other and um, and it, it was definitely a more exciting academic route than simply um, writing. It definitely makes work more accessible, I think, mm -hmm. when you use, use imagery well, yeah. Okay. Uh, did you use photography in your career or when you finished? Yeah, I mean, so I, um, so now I'm the editor of, of, of The Murmur. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I would have become or, or would have been in this position to make this newspaper if I hadn't also trained as a photographer. Mm. So before I did my master's, I did a year at uh, University of the Arts. I did a professional course in photography there, sort of honed my skills. I've been taking photographs since I was 16 years old. Okay. Um, always sort of as a hobby, but never really wanting to go professional with it. And it was only later after I finished my master's degree that I realized that it's if, if I could be a writer that can use my own photographs that's mm. that's quite powerful um, and that can really take you a long way if you can do if you can produce the whole package yourself mm. so how did you end up in Denmark yeah so we moved here my family okay um, so it's my parents and me and my brother and my sister in 1994 okay uh, my dad's a European civil servant and before that we'd lived in uh, Brussels and right. in Belgium and in Italy mm. and me and my siblings were born in in Switzerland so my parents, they left the UK in the 1980s and they still haven't moved back. Mm. Um, and then from 94 to 2002, I went to the international school here in Hellerup. In Hellerup, yeah. okay. So you're half Danish, half English now. I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, I think that that's useful. Those sorts of categorizations are useful for other people. I mean, I definitely have a lot of Danish in me. Definitely have a lot of English in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Three years ago, uh, you appeared on the newspaper Horizon uh, from nowhere. I mean, how come? So the three years before that, I was working at another English language newspaper, mm -hmm. the Copenhagen Post. Okay. Um, that was my first, uh, I sort of started when I was 26, I think, um, my first opportunity as a journalist. Um, and we had a very, very exciting period. 
um, three years taking um, a product that maybe wasn't at its in its best shape when we arrived, and you know took it to a really great place, producing weekly news in English. Mm. Um, and then, unfortunately, a restructuring of the newspaper meant that a lot of us were let go. Okay. So I was invited actually as the fourth uh, person of a team to start the Murmur. So there's four co-founders. Okay. I was the fourth one invited on. And they were working before in Copenhagen Post. We were all working at the Copenhagen Post before, and then we all chose mm -hmm. to create something mm -hmm. in our own image. Um, mm -hmm. Now there's two of us remaining. I became the editor after the first few issues, mm -hmm. maybe the first six issues or so. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've printed 35 issues, um, well into three years. Yeah. Yeah. I have looked at them. Uh, could you show one of the magazine as a newspaper you have? Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, this is... This is the latest one. This is the latest one. We've got yeah. the journalist, the historian, Adam Holm. Yes, yes. Um, from Politik and DR2. Yeah, yeah. Politik and DR2. He's, yes. uh, he's a very well-known voice, mm. um, speaks his mind. Okay. He's got a lot to say. He just yes. wrote a book about Europe, which, yes. uh, which was very interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, what does this name Murmur mean? Yeah, so when you're coming up with a name, for a newspaper, mm. um, it, it was difficult. I don't think it, it wasn't very easy. The, firstly, I think Murmur, it just sounded good, right? It's yeah, a sort no. of, it looked good, it also looked good graphically. Yes. Um, but a murmur is like, a, you know, Danes always ask, you know, what, what, what's, what's that? It's, it's, a, it's like a whisper, it's not quite exactly. a whisper. Murmur. And I think if we were to create a story, it's that um, when you're an international, an expat, an immigrant, a refugee, and, mm. and you're starting to, learn about Denmark, you can often feel like the, the debate is sort of happening here, sort of right behind you, like you're not quite, you mm. can't quite hear what's yeah. going on. It's like a murmur in the distance, yes. right? So what we hope to be is to be, um, to give perspectivized news, in-depth analysis on the biggest trends, um, the most important issues that we believe are facing Denmark, rather than focus on every day-to-day -day news. Our, our focus is on using the events of the day to get people a deeper understanding of Denmark, right? To bring the murmur closer. We're the murmur, right? We're the thing that... I, I suppose that's the story. No, 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 I understand. Yeah. <laughs> but, but then the question is that in Denmark, we have 10 national newspapers. Yeah. We have hundreds, as I said before, newspaper, magazine, monthly. And um, why was there a need for an English-speaking uh, monthly newspaper? Well, yeah, absolutely. I don't think that we would be around now if there wasn't a need for one. Okay. Uh, so why is there a need for one? I suppose um, I suppose what I learned, what we all learned from doing the Copenhagen Post together was that um, people who move to Denmark for whatever reason, whether they're just going to move here for a few months or they stay here for many, many years, when you're coming from the outside, daily news doesn't really make any sense, right? You can... There's, you know, tragic things happen and things happen in Parliament, but, you know, you, you don't necessarily understand why things are significant unless you have the background. Um, so instead of chasing the everyday news and chasing the, the headlines and being in the competition with, with, people, with the clicks on Facebook, mm -hmm. we realize that actually people, people want that in-depth yes. in, um, information. People want to really develop a stronger connection with this country. And people take the time to read the newspaper from, from cover to cover. Who yeah. are those people who you cater to? So, I mean, we've got a number of groups. I mean, okay. the, I would say our, our primary group are university educated. If they're not students finishing their expat, you know, uh, international students in Copenhagen, they're mm. um, people who have moved here from another country to pursue a career. Um, they, maybe they've met a Danish partner abroad and they've moved to Denmark um, and, they're, and they're looking to start a new life here or they've start, you know, they came here for a job and decided to stay on. Mm. And there's, a wide, there's, there's an enormous number of people who, who, who need this product. There isn't a single, um, you know, single like, uh, demographic that, that it's, that's most suited to. So it's quite to. widespread. Yeah, it's quite widespread. The need to have an <coughs> in-depth understanding of Denmark in mm. English is a widespread need. What, was it difficult to launch a new... Uh, Newspaper? No, it was quite easy. I mean, it was, <laughs> okay. well, that was. I mean, it was. It was easy in the sense that we had uh, we had advertisers that were willing to support us. We had a team of people who were, a, you know, the co-founders had mm. a, a mix of skills that enabled it to happen. You know, whether it's funding, identifying the audience, getting the distribution out. Our experience. So you, did made it analysis, you did analysis. Well, we, we knew what we were doing. Okay. Um, 
then the question is what kind of i mean i know that you do analysis and, and reportage but what kind of topics do you choose that's a really difficult question i mean okay. it's it's very i don't have a i don't have a formula for it yeah. it's because it's monthly yeah I have to have a balance of stories, right? It's society, culture, and politics. Those are the three main areas, and maybe a bit of commentary. Mm. So I'm, it's, it's difficult because the Danish media really follows, uh, they follow each other, and you end oh, up yeah. getting caught up in the whirlwind of, of, these, of these sort of nonsense stories, these, mm. these stories that are just repeated year after year. If you mm. go into a Danish newsroom, I mean, they have schedules of what they're, what's going to be in the news. And, over the next year, they can sort of predict what they're going to be covering. But you must With, be having a editorial meetings where you decide yeah, to what some kind of topics. To some extent, yeah. to some extent, yeah, this is this is built. The content is built by mm. by me as the as the as the content leader, but also the contributions from mm. my from mm. my from my staff. But my my ambition isn't to. I don't. I think it's to to build a mo more nuanced view on this country, and I think that a lot of what is going on in the Danish media mill doesn't do Denmark any justice. I mean, you must know how many times right. has the headscarf debate been debated on Danish TV. I mean, it's... Uh, all the time. All the time, yeah. When I looked at this mag uh, newspaper, which you showed uh, to our uh, viewers, I noticed um, a mixture of uh, reportage. Um, actually, you start with month in review, city politics, immigration, social issues, digital future, illegal labor, a cover story of uh, Adam, victims of hate crime, NGO efforts, jazz music and women, wine, and finally EU. How are these so diverse issues correlate? I mean, that's, uh, that's an impossible question to answer. <laughs> I, mean, that's, I mean, that's also that's the beauty. That's your newspaper. Yeah, but this is the beauty of a newspaper, right? So the idea is that uh, uh, I get a feel for what the, the pace of the paper is going to be and what story should come first. Obviously, at the beginning, you want the small stuff. At the end, you maybe want some more uh, softer cultural things. And in the yes. middle, you've got the meat and how you arrange that meat. Um, it's, you know, you've got to put yourself in the mind of the meat reader. You don't want it to be too heavy too early on, but you want to still catch them with some serious stories. I mean, overall, it just has to build a balance. It's a story. Um, it's like every single issue is like um, a little novella about Denmark, mm. right? You're supposed to read it and then you're supposed to get, you know, all of these different vignettes on what's happening in this country that together build some sort of image in your head of what's going on. And that's the benefit of print. So people often ask, like, why don't we just go online? Well, I can't build that if I'm just putting stories onto a website that people can sort of click out of. But when you have a newspaper, you, you know, you hold it. <laughs> you read it, you go through it, you know, you take the time. There's one story, right? And different there. feelings also yeah. holding this. Time. There's a lot of people saying the same things. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure many people uh, will be thinking now, how do you finance this uh, project? A mix of advertising and government funding. Okay. Yeah. Was it uh, because uh, government is sometimes very laid back in <laughs> giving money? I, no, I actually don't think that they're laid back at all. Okay. <laughs> I would say um, the hardest part of one of the hardest parts of my job is yeah. dealing with dealing with bureaucracy and and government. I would say, I, let me be clear. I think that the Danish media support system is mm. incredibly unique and wonderful. Um, I think other countries could really learn from the way that newspapers are funded here so that they become less dependent upon... Um, readership. Yeah, on the, in the readership in terms of the fact you, you've got these really specialized newspapers like Weekend of Reason and, yeah. and, and Information and Kristi mm. Daubler that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for this media support. Sure. and. Even though they don't make money, they're not sort of financially viable products in many ways. They're still incredibly important to the mm. Danish society. Mm. Um, I would blame Brexit in the UK to a large extent of media that's just um, taken over by special interests, mm. um, pushing a, an agenda which is not reflected by the rest. So I think in Denmark, it's uh, we get money, we get money, we get a production studio, mm. and I'm super happy about that. I'm very grateful for it. I'm happy it's, for you too. Oh, but it's still a pain. <laughs> yes, you know, it's, it I is. still don't enjoy doing it. I remember we had yeah. a magazine called Ethnica, and we yeah. had exactly the same, both in Danish yeah. and English. And because it was published by minorities, they yeah. said no. Anyway, okay. uh, <laughs> um, you have enough journalists and writers yeah. uh, to cover all these topics. Do you also get stories from your contributors? Well, so... Uh, 
Um, I mean, they're, they're sort of the same thing, contributors. I mean, well, uh, people who read, you know, and oh, write yeah. to you. Yeah, I mean, I do get tips. I mean, people do write in, and I would say I've had a number of pretty pretty good stories in the newspaper that I wouldn't have written if it wasn't for people tipping me off. Yeah. But, I mean, not just my readers, my entire network. I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to produce this newspaper if it wasn't for having um, and knowing <coughs> a, a large number of people that I can draw upon for their, for their mm. ideas and expertise. Mm. So it's definitely not... I mean, this is this is the like the summation of my entire broader general network. Mm. You have a large network now. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I had to build one after I moved back from the UK in two thousand and eight. Mm. I, you know, I hadn't really grown up anywhere. Um, all of my friends from high school they'd gone off, you know, uh, because we were an international school. Yeah. I found myself in a position finishing my master's degree. I lived in London, didn't know anybody. Um, big lonely city. Um, and so when I came back here in, for the summer in 2008, I thought, okay, I, I kind of know enough people, I can build on something here. Mm. So I spent a couple of years really just, uh, just trying to meet as many people as possible. And, so, and also because I like people. I mean, mm. I enjoy going out and meeting people, but yeah, it wasn't... Do, it wasn't do you have fun. also many known personalities like politicians and writers who also contribute sometimes? Yeah, so for example, in this issue, I had uh, Holger Kroh Nielsen, the former leader of, of uh, SF, the former foreign minister. He, uh, I wrote to him for an op-ed about the EU, and he, he contributed. Um, you know, there are there are some, but I try to, you know, you know, the member isn't really trying to seek recognition from the established um, hierarchies within the Danish media or within the Danish society. We, of course, lean up against it and we draw upon it. But it helps to have known names. It does help to some extent. I was, you know, uh, I, w I think it's... Um, I think, like, still many known names in Denmark, just like the majority of, of the Danish media society, like... What I get very often from from Danes is that they they think that this is they think this is just for internationals. They think it's just for expats. They mm. think it's sort of. Uh, I was interviewed on 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 the on DR once where the interviewer um, brought me in and we did the interview in Danish and then he looked at it and he said, "Yeah, but you know, it's not for me, right? It's because I'm I'm a Dane." Um, <laughs> and I'm like, "Look, mate." <laughs> You read English, right? Exactly. Like these stories are still very important. They're still, you know, you can still read them. You can still understand them, right? The point is that you can understand them and then two billion other people can read them as well instead of five million Danes. So my point is, I think that Danes still have this very narrow idea of what constitutes like a legitimate media world or, you know, what is, what is you know, you, Peter and the Murmur. Oh, you're, you're creating a nice project, but it's, it's, not, for, it's not for, you know, normal Danes. We it's get like, the same question now. Yeah. So why, you, <laughs> why you make TV programs still, in English? Yeah. Still, no, I have a lot of Danish readers and a huge support from, from the Danish you community You recently well. celebrated three years yeah. of anniversary. Um, if you have to count your successes and failures, what would it be? So I think the major success is that we're still around. Right, of course. Um, that we have built a model um, through the contributors and the partners and the co-founders that is sustainable. That's that's the major success. We are trying to simply build upon each issue and make sure each issue is as good as the last one. And while it's not a, an enormous um, business and it's not making a, you know tons and tons of money, um, we're certainly not very rich, but I think that that's the most important is that we're consistent because the most important thing with this newspaper is the readers. We're doing this for the readers. We're doing this for the market. So, mm -hmm. so failures, I mean, I don't know. I mean, too many to count, you know. We, we leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are your stories also picked up by the national press or, you know, because it's the other way around too many times? Rarely. I'm, I, did, I did interview one man about and his inability to find work in the Danish labor market, a former, former refugee from, from Congo who lived oh, here okay. since 2002, I think it was. And despite effort, you know, you know, just trying and trying and trying and trying, learning languages, you know, you know he, he was overqualified for most of the jobs he wanted and he still couldn't find any work. And he was later then interviewed. I'm quite sure he was then later interviewed by DR mm. after he appeared in our newspaper. But our, our job is not to break news. 
You know, I do not have the resources to put in freedom of information requests and to be seeking. You know, I'm not out to impress anybody. I'm not out to impress the Danish media. How about social media? Do you have a good relationship with them? Well, social media, again, I mean, the problem with that is that you have to pay Facebook to, to so that people can actually see your, see your stuff. And also, if you wanted success on social media, you've got to, uh, to some extent, compromise on the quality of, of your product. People don't, you know, I tell you, out of this issue, um, it's not the big in-depth stories yeah. that get shared a lot on social media. It's the Bjarke Ingels is making a new panda house. Yeah, That's what people love yeah. on social media. So I could, I could, do I want to build a newspaper with yeah, those sorts yeah. of stories? No. But do you get a response from your readers? Do, do they write read, uh, letters to editors? So I'll tell you, I actually have one regular writer. Um, okay. This writer is somebody who really does not agree with me or the oh. uh, approach of this newspaper. I get accused... Um, he he's he's quite right wing. He's from a suburb of Copenhagen, and he's uh, and he and every once in a while he shares his opinion with me about okay. me being a cultural radical or or, or oh. sort of a, a naive left winger. And the the fact that we still communicate rarely every you know every six months means I think that we sort of and he reads it. <laughs> it shows that he's still reading the newspaper. I see that as an enormous success, really. But your magazine is also dotted with ads, you know, especially from from language schools. Yeah. Why is this specific focus on that language? Schools. Well, language schools are just a very good. I mean, they know that we have access to uh, to their clientele, and Danes uh, foreigners get free language classes. I think for the first two or three years mm. while they're in Denmark, maybe even four. I'm not sure. Mm. Um, Denmark is an attractive country to come and start a life, start a business, especially you know after you're studying as an EU student. So um, we have access to these readers. They want to access the same people. That's kind of how it works. I think. Our program is about Danish society and ethnic minorities, both basically. Um, do you also have readers among the ethnic minorities, refugees, immigrants, you know, not expats, you know, I'm talking about people from different countries. Yeah, so we distribute, I, I mean, I think we still distribute to the trampoline house, for example, um, and we at one point had to think how to deal with, with the Red Cross. I mean, I'm not, I can't, you can't no, count no, me on this no, because no. I, have, I don't actually keep the, the distribution. But is it free, no? It's, it's free. Okay. I mean, it's supposed to be for everybody. And, yes. I, and I imagine like a large number of mm. refugees will be able to read it. Yeah. Um, and I really That's hope I that they do. <laughs> Did you, at the Trampoline House? Yes. Did you? Great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. With Trampoline House, a refugee community yes. center for those yeah. who don't know. So, yeah. yeah. Um, do you also invite uh, writers and opinion makers among ethnic minorities to write uh, pieces or I mean, I'm, interview them? It's, you know, it depends on whether or not, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna choose them just because they're an ethnic minority. No, no, right? no, I mean, but I have to ask you. Yeah, <laughs> I would say, I mean, ethnic minorities often appear in the newspaper because they in often- In a negative way. In a negative way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in the sense that, I mean, we've had ethnic minority writers just writing about anything, okay. uh, you know, anything and, and that's everything. What, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I don't mean writing about minorities, but also about traffic and other issues, you know, wine. And well, the, I mean, the writers that we have simply depend mm. upon the people who are available and want to write at a particular moment in time. So, uh, I mean, and ethnic minorities, I would actually say that, you know, yeah, I mean, there's among our readers, let's say the international community that moves to Denmark mm. that would read the newspaper. Mm. There aren't so many ethnic minorities in that group, maybe. I don't know. It's a hard, it's it's hard mostly to, Europeans moving. Yeah, it's Europe. mostly Europeans. I mean, to be honest, I'm just interested in people who... Um, so you don't yeah. deal with the integration of those experts, minorities? In what do you mean? What's the... I mean, um, give them those informations or discuss those issues, how Danish government is uh, dealing with with people from uh, different countries you know and what kind of difficulties they have so you're talking about so the question is whether or not we write stories yes, about exactly. like, like okay so or maybe analysis not so much story yeah. but analysis so yeah. what we have in the next issue is a story about um the the changes to permanent residency exactly. for example okay. yeah. yeah so we i try to make sure that we don't we're not simply a, st an, a newspaper writing in just about immigration all the time. No, no, we no. pick the good stories, we pick them when the time is up. And right now the government's just changed the permanent residency laws again. Um, and it's really upended people's lives in a really negative way. And I mean, for people who don't keep track of, of the law, there's a lot of people that have been caught out actually. They've completely had to rearrange their plans for their mm -hmm. life. 
because of these changes last year and this year. So we've written a big feature about that. Um, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a big feature about Yesterday, that. Yesterday, the Council of Europe came with a report about Denmark, where actually they said that the mm. issue of residence and family reunions yeah. of people, you know, that Denmark should think about that. You know. yeah. What are your future plans for the MAG? Yeah, the so, newspaper? I mean, as, as, we, um, as I said, I mean, the, the most important thing is to remain as consistent as possible. Um, I would love to grow it. I'd love to be, you know, fortnightly. I would love to be able to hire journalists to sit beside me every day instead of... Um, instead of just having a few contributors. I think it's a dream scenario to make the newspaper as it is, I would say. Mm. And just being able to continue making it would be the continuation of a dream, really. So um, whatever plans that I might have, whatever would be built on that. I mean, it will come automatically. It will, it will, <laughs> it'll come whenever it's ready. And I wouldn't, and I wouldn't want to, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't know whether I'd want to sort of jinx it by, by talking about fine, it ahead fine, of time. Yeah. Uh, you are, you have a British background, <clears throat> you're white. Do you ever, or did you ever experience uh, unequal treatment in Danish society when you were launching the newspaper or anything else? Yeah, so I, so I, I experienced enormous positive discrimination, I Wonderful. think. Yeah, um, I get that extra second with people to talk to people because they're, why am I... British that can speak Danish why have I been here I think I get I think that's you know being that's that's benefited me being able to sort of be just a little bit be a little bit different it's an added advantage yeah, I'd, I'd actually <laughs> say it has been an advantage yeah um I do get treated differently in that sense and it and I would say it is enormously frustrated to have to ex it's frustrating to have to explain to people almost every single day why I'm here this it's the same question right so why are you here and it's well, I have to. <laughs> I've lived here since I was at nine years exactly. old, ten years old. You can sack and snack dance, you know. Like, no, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. but uh, but that's just part of my position. I just have mm. to. I just say. I Bes just explain. Peter, yeah. besides this newspaper, monthly newspaper, uh, it's not. Is it available also on internet? Yeah, of course it is. <coughs> so all it, the articles go online over the course of the okay, month, and so then people can go and read it. Yeah, yeah, and the PDF is is goes online as soon as it's up. Yeah. Okay. Well, with this wonderful message, thank you very much You're for very coming, welcome, and I'm really happy. Yeah. And I'm sure that our viewers have come to know this wonderful uh, newspaper. And uh, until next time, take good care of yourself.